And we're joined now by David Gervais, an attorney from Plattsburgh, who's originally from Montreal, I who am. practices immigration. You specialize in immigration along with other areas of the law. Welcome. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Janet McFetridge, who you know, says that she's seeing a bit of a drop off in recent weeks in the number of asylum seekers crossing the border at Roxham Road. In all, about 40,000 over the past couple of years have gone into Quebec using that route there, hoping to be granted asylum and be allowed to stay in, in Canada. The reasons by the thousands that they're picking that dirt pathway is they know if they get into Quebec illegally and get arrested, their chances of staying in Quebec are better or they at least are guaranteed a hearing. They're almost guaranteed a hearing. The, actually, uh, a lot of people say that they illegally enter Canada. It's not, it's not, exa it's not exactly true. They irregularly enter Canada. In uh, 1951, Canada signed a uh, UN convention which says that if you're making uh, a refugee claim in Canada, you are allowed to go through it by any means. You don't have to cross into a regular border. So if you go through Roxham Road, technically it's not illegal to do so, as long as you're able to make a claim uh, for an uh, asylum claim. Technically not illegal, but there most people, the word is getting back to the yeah. States to, to yeah. use that means because if they go to the main border crossings right. and try to go the proper channels because of the safe third country Absolutely. agreement. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of these people, they have back. to go through, uh, they have to make the claim for a uh, refugee status or asylum claim within Canada. So they have to enter first. If you try to do this through the regular border, uh, they're going to say, well, you're coming from the U.S. because of the safe third country agreement you had to make that claim in the first safe country that you came to. And in your case, if you're in the U.S., you have to make that claim in the U.S. So if you try to make that claim at a regular port of entry, you're going to be denied. You're, you're going to be turned around and sent back to the U.S. The reason why Roxham Road is so popular is because once you're into, you can only steps, make 10 steps, you're into Canada, you get processed by uh, RCMP. Some people say that you're technically arrested, you're not really arrested, you're brought to the border station. But as soon as you're in Canada, you're allowed to make that claim, regardless of if you come to the, from the United States or, in, or another country. That's why Roxham Road is so uh, popular with uh, migrants. So they can stay, make the claim, and they're allowed to remain in the country until they have their hearing. Uh, right, so the way that it's a three-step process, the way that it usually works, you're brought, as soon as you're, you're, you enter Canada, you either have the obligation to go to a port of entry, uh, or they escort, in, in Roxham Road's case, they ex escort you to uh, the closest port of entry, which I think is Lacol. Once there, there's a board officer, um, border officer who will determine if you have a valid claim to make, if they deem that you're eligible to make the claim for refugee status. You'll have to stay in Canada. You're going to receive all kinds of services, which is a big difference between how Canada handles these claims and the United States does. In Canada, if you're deemed eligible to make the claim, you have access to work, work permits, health care, uh, certain subsidies. There's a lot of social services that are made available to you. Kids You're, can go to school. Kids can go to school. Uh, they get language lessons, either French or English. Um, and the process of integration already starts even before your claim is ever adjudicated. The actual adjudication of the claim can take up to two years, uh, but during those two years, you're more or less part of the Canadian fabric. You're allowed to work. You're allowed to have your kids in school. So when they check in there, when they're at the border, do they have to make their case right then and there? And, and is there an evaluation of whether or not they have a legitimate claim? They, uh, for the case of Roxham Road, when you when you first meet with the RCMP officers, basically you just tell them, I'm here to make an asylum claim. They bring you to the port, to a port of entry, and there uh, somebody uh, from the border agency will review your claim to see if you meet the, the basic requirements. If they deem that uh, your, your claim is, uh, you're eligible to make the claim, then uh, you're allowed, formally allowed to enter Canada and you're given all these services. On the other hand, if they think that you don't meet the requirements, uh, they can put in place a deportation order almost immediately. And in some cases, you're, by, you're brought right back either to the U.S. or the country that you're originally from. Or if you have a criminal record or there's... There's a, there's a whole host of reasons. If you've been granted protected status somewhere else, you can't use it in Canada. Uh, if you have certain criminal convictions, it makes you ineligible. There's, there's several requirements that you need to meet. And then when they do arrive in Quebec and Canada, as you mentioned, uh, you've talked to colleagues up there, the, the, the wait is pretty substantial. It can take up to two years, roughly, to have Just to get a hearing. To have your hearing adjudicated, yep. And is that because 
they're just overwhelmed. There's a huge backlog. I saw uh, recently in a, on one of the Canadian websites that there's uh, close to 40,000 cases that are awaiting a hearing. <laughs> Canada's put more money into more resources, but it's, there's a lot of... Just last year in Quebec, there's over 16,000 claims. Three quarters of those were made by people that went through irregularly at the Roxham Road. And so once they get their hearing, those who have had their hearings, uh, have you heard from colleagues up there, are the majority being allowed to stay in Canada or are the majority um, being In 2017, the, uh, the average success rate was about 50, I think it was like 57%. So 57% of people making an asylum claim were granted uh, asylee status. They're allowed to stay in, the US, in Canada. This year in Quebec, the success rate is closer to 40%. Uh, that's there's a significant drop. I think there's some pressure from the local population that um, I think some members of society feel that there's there's almost a, I wouldn't call it an invasion, but there's a lot of people coming in. It's starting to raise some eyebrows in some some communities. But even at forty percent, uh, that's a higher figure. That's a higher success rate than it is in the U.S. So technically, you have more chances in Canada than you do in the U.S. And the argument they have to make, what will be accepted as an argument to allow someone to stay in Canada? They have to be persecuted or they have to show that they or their, their families are in grave danger from either war or violence or? Absolutely, ba basically the, the Canada follows, uh, just like the US I think, maybe, maybe less so, but they follow um, UN treaty terms. Um, a protected person is a person who if he goes back to the country, is personally or close family members are subject to torture, uh, illegal arrest, detention. Uh, you have to make uh, a specific claim. You can't just say in general that things are bad in my country and I, I want to stay in Canada. You have to be able to specifically say why uh, as it pertains to you. That wait, uh, a two-year wait, has to be hard on, on, on these people. Uh, yeah. Many of them may not find work right away and right. so they... There's a lot of barriers. There's language barriers, cultural barriers. Um, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's definitely it's not an easy task to uproot your entire family, put everything you own in a suitcase, and <laughs> come to Roxham Road. You yeah. have to feel for what they're you, going yeah, absolutely. through. Absolutely. Yeah, some of the stories are heart wrenching. You. It, it, that's one of the biggest things I take back from having practiced immigration law for several years. In some cases, it seems like the government um, is not willing to. They have these general policies. Well, the reason why you have humans uh, handling these policies is that you can make a decision based on an individual case. I feel that sometimes the government just makes a blanket policy decision and they don't see the person for who they are and what they've gone through and what they're facing. And that's, that's difficult to work with on a daily basis, for sure. The people that are being sent back, in many cases, if they only had a, if they had a visa to the U.S. but intended all along to go to Canada, will they get called on that? Will they? Several, several um, I found have been jailed on the way back. They were sent back from Canada at that time. At that point, they're entering the U.S. without a visa. Um, a lot of times you'll see the husband, <laughs> unfortunately, get incarcerated. They leave mom and the children out, obviously, uh, which is good to see. Uh, but then now, on top of having the immigration issues that are still not resolved, they were turned back from Canada. On top of that, now in the U.S., they face criminal charges for being in, entering the country or being in the country illegally. And do you have any clients you're representing? Um, I've had I've had a few. I've had several Haitians who um, applied. They were in the U.S. They had temporary protected status. They felt that that wasn't going to be uh, around that much longer, so they applied in Canada. They were declined. Uh, and fortunately, they had left their wives and kids in the U.S., so they had to come back. Illegally, they were picked up at the border. Um, thankfully, the sanctions are not too, too harsh. They're looking at 15 to 30 days in jail. Um, but then they're handed to uh, USCIS, which is U.S. Immigration and Citizenship uh, Services, for deportation. And while they're here, is, are those some of the cases that Plattsburgh Cares formed around? Were they seeing these people yes. being sent back from the border and their families were here with them and they had used all their money to get here and try to get into Canada and found themselves yep, stranded stranded absolutely. in Plattsburgh. They are they're literally stranded. They have no resources, no there's no family, there's no there's no financial support. Uh, and we've had several families that are just absolutely stranded. 
And that's where the community has rallied around them and come to their support and yep. found them places to stay and help them. And yep, there's houses that have been provided to them. They put the kids in school while the petitions are pending or while immigration is doing what they're going to do. Uh, trying to afford, especially for the kids, they're trying to afford, uh, trying to offer some sort of support uh, for the families while they're going through these, really there's heart-wrenching uh, period of their lives that everything's in chaos. and. David Gervais, thank you very much for You're taking the time to be with us. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Good to be here.